expertise of the members of our network. The NatureServe network, for those that don't, don't know, uh, it's made up of, um, so far, 87 member organizations from Patagonia to Alaska. And we're working together on different projects, including climate change, invasive species, ecosystem services, citizen science, land degradation and restoration. And recently, uh, 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 a project related to, to medicinal plants in the Amazon. If you are based in the Latin American and Caribbean region, being mm -hmm. a member of our network doesn't cost anything. Our network is open and our main objective is to fa facilitate. Oh, what happened? We're still on hold. Miguel, I think we're still on hold. Okay, so not, nothing happened. Okay. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Can anyone hear me? Hello there. Good afternoon. This is the this is the webinar Pulse of the Planet. Welcome. And I want to make sure that uh, we're taking care of some technical details here. Can you can you hear me? Okay, I can see. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, I was speaking on a uh, on on a muted microphone. <laughs> My name is Miguel. I am the director of the Latin American and Caribbean Network for NatureServe. And I want to welcome all of you to this <laughs> new edition of the webinar Pulse of the Planet. This is an initiative uh, led by us, NatureServe, and supported by the Geobon Secretariat and Eco Health Alliance. Our work is our, our, our job, our objective here is to spread the word and share the scientific expertise from our member, member organizations and experts. The NatureServe network is made up of 87 member organizations from Patagonia to Alaska, and we're working on different aspects of global change, including invasive species, ecosystem services, citizen science, um, land degradation and restoration, you name it. If you're based in this region, in Latin America and the Caribe, being a member of our network doesn't cost you anything. Our network is open and our main objective is to facilitate and manage regional projects that have to do with global change. If your organization is interested in participating of this network, of this communication network, please do not hesitate and contact me. Today we have invited Dr. Nuno Negroes to give us a talk. Dr. Negroes leads the research and monitoring team at Conservation Amazonica in Bolivia, one of the youngest, but at the same time, most active biodiversity conservation organization in the region and member of the Nature Center Network. His work focuses on the ecology and conservation of large carnivores with several publications on high impact journals. His postdoctoral training was in science communication and as a result, he has led and co-authored several exhibitions, videos, books, including uh, comics for kids that highlight the importance of making our science relevant. Without further delay, it is an honor and a pleasure today to be able to give the floor to Nuno. Thank you, Nuno. Take it away. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you very much. Uh, greetings to everybody. Good afternoon and greetings from the Andes. I would like to start to say thank you to NatiServe, Geobon, EcoHealth Alliance for the invitation to be present. So I will start my presentation and just take my, my video, so make it easy. Okay. So today I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about our activities related to monitoring in different areas that we have. Uh, and to start, for those who don't know Bolivia, I would like to take you to, uh, let's say, the northeast of Bolivia, Amazon, uh, where uh, the majority of the area is still covered by forests. 90% of the area in this region, which is called the Departamento of Pando, still is covered by forests. Nevertheless, there are more than 100,000 people living there. And these people live in multiple communities that, that live emerge in the forest. The people that live in this, in this area depend on, on the forest and the forest resources. 
and their main income is the Brazil nut. But just don't let the name misguide you. It's called Brazil nut, but Bolivia actually is the main exporter of this product. I just don't want to cause any international conflict, but that's the fact. So these communities every year, these people every year go to the forest, not only the people that live in these communities, but people that come from different parts of Bolivia enter the forest from November to March, more or less, to collect Brazil nut. And the money they get from the, the Brazil nut recollection is the one is gonna be uh, their main income throughout the year. But these communities also hunt, they fish, they also collect other, other uh, products from the forest like acai, some do gold mining, others do some small scale agriculture and forestry. So you can see overall, all these people that live in the Bolivian Amazon depend on natural resources and spend a lot of time in the, in the forest. And so they have a lot of interaction with wildlife. So the areas that we work, you know, intervene, has different kind of, of area, different types of area. From, for instance, we have like indigenous community like Tacanados and Tim. We have a national protected area like Manuripi Reserve. Santa Rosa is a department protected area. Bruno Haco, another department protected area and some field stations. So these are the areas. And they vary not only in terms of type, but also in terms of extension. We have areas very large, like at Takana 2, with four, three, uh, 432,000 hectares, Manripa Reserve, seven, 747,000 hectares, and small areas, like biological stations, with slightly over 3,000 hectares. So apart from different types of territories, different extensions of territories, we also have to interact with different actors from government, from the national level, also local level and regional level, also have to work with universities, communities and indigenous organizations. So when you think about the, all this complexity, we were thinking about how can we evaluate what we are doing, but not only evaluate what we are doing, but also to observe the changes that occur are occurring both at local and at larger scale. So, made, of course, monitoring is the, let's say, the management instrument that we can use, not only to feed decision making, but also to evaluate our specific actions. But we envision monitoring as a system that interacts synergetically with research. So, in a way, the research feeds monitoring, and monitoring can raise some questions that research has to answer. So to build our monitoring programs, we develop a, a protocol that I'm going to share. If the uh, it's not working, what happened? Sorry. Okay. Sorry, slight problem. So first, we start by collecting information about the area, you know, and specifically the human activities, the socioeconomics, the biodiversity values. And based on that, we define objectives because sometimes uh, we are working on an area that's just been uh, a protected area, for instance, that is just being established. So what are, we define what are the objectives of this area. And according to the objectives of this area, we also define what are the indicators. And we do a final design of the monitoring system. We go to the field to collect the data, the baseline that allow us to evaluate all the process. Till now, we have uh, worked basically all the protocol in the different areas that we've been working uh, till the collecting data, the baseline. Evaluation is something that we still don't do deeply because we start doing this monitoring system basically from 2017 forward. So, but instead of just to explain you what, how we do it, just show me, like, let me show with you and share with you an example I think is better to understand. So let's go to Santa Rosa de Laguna. Santa Rosa de Laguna is an area that we help create as a department a protected area. We work with the municipality of Santa Rosa de Laguna to create this, this protected area and we work with them till, since then. So the first thing we did, like I said, is to collect all the information about we can about the area in terms of socioeconomics, biodiversity, 
uh, even culture. And then we met with the communities to ask them to set the objectives for this area, since we were creating an area from scratch. And we asked them about their perceptions, what do they value, what is that, what's important to them, and how do they envision the future of the area and for them. And at the same time, of course, we ask about the problems and the threats. Overall, in these communities and the majority, if not the total area in the, in the Bolivian Amazon, of, the, the main goal is always to have a compatibil uh, compatibility between improving livelihoods and conservation by preserving the natural resources, but thinking about sustainability and also protecting biodiversity. But also, also think about what are the main threats to the functionality of the social ecological system that works in these areas. So after the meetings with the communities, after setting the objectives, what we did after that is define what will be the elements that we need to monitor. And it, at, for each element, what will be the objective, objects to monitor and the indicators. We always aim for a, a low cost, simple indicators because as everybody knows, money is not, th not something that we don't have in abundance when working on this kind of projects, and especially for monitoring, and especially if you think about long-term monitoring. Usually there's not resources to keep this system going. So at the end, we had uh, uh, our proposed program, monitoring program for the objective. We have two objectives. One was diversify the economic sources of the communities and to improve the income from productive activities that has elements like products from the forest, like Brazil, nut and acai, agriculture and agroforestry, like the main uh, products they produce for their not only for feeding for self-consumption but also to sell and also raising animals that they also do for self-consumption and for selling and the majority all of them have indicators and the majority of this information was to be collected to interviews then the other objective was the preservation of biodiversity and the function of existing ecosystems and the elements that we consider were fauna, basically large and medium mammals and, and birds, because they hunt, so be a, a main direct impact that people had on fauna, and fish. Also some threats more related to deforestation and fires, threats to the forest, and of course water, because they, it was something that every community highlighted as very important to them, and they're really concerned about the current situation and the future. So each one has its indicator and the methods to uh, evaluate. So in terms of, of uh, the socioeconomics, the majority, as you said, was about interviews. So we have the design of the monetary program established. So we, we went then to get information for the baseline. So we did interviews to the different communities, a total of 195 families, which is 35% of the families that live inside the, the area. And of course, we get the results from the socioeconomics, and we're going to share just a couple of them. In terms of, of uh, the objective in Brazil Nut, what we did use as indicators is the number of families who collect Brazil Nut, the number of bags, average number of bags that each family collected per year, and the amount of money each, can, each family earned per year due to Brazil Nut. And in Santa Rosa, basically, we saw the 78% of the families that we interviewed collect Brazil nut. The average uh, number of bags collected per year was 41 bags per family, and they more or less earned what equivalent to $3,300 per year per family. If, for instance, we compare this with another area like Takana, where the same indicators show that the number of families is 100%, everybody in Takana collects Brazil nut. And the number of bags is considerably larger, 149 bags per year per family. And even consequently, the amount of money is also bigger. It is more or less $12,000 12, uh, $12, per family. Apart from the socioeconomics, you collect for all the, all the other elements and, and, and objects. We also did the deforestation evaluation using the standard methodology with analysis of Landsat and interpretation of the images to detect changes of soil use. So that's something that we do at the large scale, not only in these areas, but at the Pando department scale. 
For wildlife, or for fun specifically, since hunting is a main activity there, you use camera traps. So together with the communities, we set uh, several campaigns of camera traps uh, on a total of 76 uh, camera trap stations that allow us to identify the occurrence of, of important species, not only uh, because on, there are threatened species like the tapir here, like the white lay peccary, of course, the jaguar, the short ear dog, the giant anteater, the giant amadillo. These species are not only dangerous, but also the species, some of them are the main source, uh, main species that are hunted. So it's a way of evaluating the hunted pressure. This data from camera traps, we can take apart from the species occurrence, we can always, always analyze relative abundance also. In some cases, we also can uh, determine density if we can identify the individuals and but our main goal our main indicator if you want it would be occupancy which is a very uh, common now use indicator in other projects in other areas so we collect our data we design a pro our pro our program monitoring program for each area we collect the data and now we think it's very important to give back to give back to the communities and to institutions uh, to give the information back. So we made an infographic of all the, the, all, all the program in terms of elements of, of monitoring and objects of monitoring and results in terms of indicators. We think it's a very simple way of people understanding uh, what, what's the results. And for this infographic, we made a calendar for it because, you know, people in Bolivian Amazon really like calendars <laughs> and like to to put calendars and posters in their walls is something that's going to stay there for a long time, and they're going to look uh, look to them uh, throughout the year very long, many times. We, like I said, we do have mainly concentrating on collecting the baseline information, but we also uh, had some data from different years, so we can have already some ideas of of monitoring in terms of change between some years, and we're going to change, show you some, some results. Not many because we have a limit time. This is the percentage of income that comes from Brazil net on, on the people's perception in Takana 2. So here, I think you can see this is overall of all Takana 2. This is 2017, this is 2018, and this is, you can see a, a, a decrease between 2017 and 2018. That is also seen in other communities. This is another community, Mercedes, Puerto Perez, decrease, El Tigre, decrease, and also in Toromonas. So what we see here is that, um, that um, curious enough, 2017 was a year that the production of Brazil nut was less than usual. But nevertheless, they seem to have uh, got more, more income from that. So the price of Brazil was higher, although they collect less. This is very interesting in terms of monitoring. Then, if you can look specifically to some communities like Puerto Perez, you can see this decrease also. Uh, but in some communities were smaller decrease in case of Toro Monas, for instance, the decrease was was, was quite considerable and probably significant on their point of view. We also can use this data to compare and to understand a little bit more better about the socioeconomics of the different areas uh, and, and compare the, the different areas. In this case, it's the same, same question about the percentage of income from the different activities. And as you can see, the main income activity for both areas, the Cana and Santa Rosa is the Brazil net. But then the other activities, there are a source of income, I differ between them. I say something is very important to Santa Rosa, but agriculture and agroforestry is the second main source of income. So they are very, uh, they, they tend to spend time and money invest in this activity. When in Takana, they have more diverse types of, of activities uh, with, a, with a equal more balance between them. Santa Rosa is more Brazil nut and, and natural forest resources and like Brazil nut and acai and agriculture and some raising some animals. So this is very interesting. Also camera traps, we did several camera trap campaigns and in one area we did, we did compare the camera traps or the, 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 the wildlife be, before the Brazil nut season, like I said, be, before November 
March and the one after to see if the activity itself had any impact on the wildlife. So in the same area, we did this, we set the camera traps before and after the Brazil nut grape collection season. And we managed, for instance, to, to determine uh, overall jaguar abundance between 40.3 and 6.6 .6 jaguars per 100 square kilometers using the standard methodology of special species analysis. And we also so determined our baseline in terms of, of uh, occupancy. Uh, probably not everybody's familiar with that, but basically we have information that we can say what is the occupancy. Occupancy is the percentage of the area this, that is occupied by the species. So, um, and here we also tested if the before and after Brazil not having inflation in some species it did, in others it didn't have it. During our talks with the communities, our meetings with the communities, there's one thing that uh, showed up as a, as a problem to them, which was the, that some wild species were considered a threat. Uh, so we started a project, some projects, to start understanding this and also to monitor because some of these threatened of the species are threatened, like the jaguar and then like the giant otter, they, they are threatened uh, according to UCN. If you think about the jaguar, a large predator that usually is, is considered a threat to human lives and domestic animals, these communities that live side by side have probably a particular view and a particular relationship with the species. And unfortunately, sometimes this relationship ends badly from one of the sides, usually the jaguar. And even this relationship can be seen um, in the cultural manifestations uh, they have. For instance, this is a photograph of a celebration they had on Mother's Day in Bolivia, in one of the communities, where these kids were dressed using um, traditional clothes, and you can see some of them have jaguar skins, and the, they did dances, theater sketches, other activities, and one of them was a dance, and the highlight moment of this dance is when they kill the jaguar. So as you can see the negative is, is there deep, deep in the culture. As we want, we work for uh, this equilibrium, this coexistence between wildlife, between uh, livelihoods and, and conservation, we do see that this is something that is very important to, to monitor. So we went to, to do some research on this and to evaluate the conflict in these three areas. The, Okay, the Takana two indigenous community, the Manuripi Reserve, and the Santa Rosa area. One thing that I forgot to mention, all of these are people from the Amazon, but the Santa Rosa has a, a specific characteristic, is that a lot of people that live here are people that are immigrant from the Andes area, so it's, it has some socioeconomics also that is different from the others. So we did a typical uh, interviews, Trying to approach attitudes, emotion, beliefs, knowledge, risk perception, tolerance, incident, incidents with people and jaguars and animals, sorry, social norms, and of course, number of jaguar killings and why do they kill jaguars. So in total, we have a diagnosed a baseline of 533 people that we interviewed. And one of the, at least my favorite. Uh, questions and methods to have an idea what are the conflicts and what are the species conflict is this participatory risk mapping. Basically we ask the people to list the species they consider a threat to their life or to their livelihood, so they risk, they list the species and then we ask them to rank them, order them according to the less, from the most dangerous or more, most risky species to the least one. And then we calculate these three index. So we have the incidence index. So it's the, the percentage of people that mention a determined species. And we have the severity index, which is calculated by a formula. But basically, it says uh, which are the species that, when they are present and co co cause problems, species that they consider more severe in terms of the impact they have. So the severe index is an inverted index. So the lower is the more severe species, the higher, the less severe species. So at the end, we expect this, this part of the lower part of the, of the graph 
present the, the species that have a higher, consider the higher conflict ones. So comparing, for instance, the areas, we have the Manuripi Reserve, where snakes were, were the species they consider more threatened, and jaguars were the second one, and white lay peccary were the third one. So these, for Manuripi, these were the three more complicated species, snake associated to damage to or possible risk of attacking people or causing deaths, jaguar more associated to both risk of, of people attacking people or damage to domestic animals and widely peccary because they eat the Brazil nut. In case of Takana, in this case, the jaguars were the main, the main conflict species, followed by the ocelot and the snake. The ocelot because it caused damage to domestic animals. So slightly different from Anuripi. And if you compare to Santa Rosa, a different result comes because the main species they consider a conflict is the agouti, which is a, an animal that can eat, uh, of course, their crops. The white lepecary for the same reasons, and, the, and also can eat the Brazil nut, and also agouti can eat the Brazil nut and the parrot. So where the species, conflict species were more associated about the Brazil nut and the agriculture. And as I, maybe you remember, Agriculture was a big thing in Santa Rosa. We also ask about the feelings. So ask about what are your feelings toward the Jaguar? Uh, from don't like the Jaguar, like the Jaguar being different. And here, Takana was more negative feeling than actually all the others, and with a significant difference. Also, we did a typical tolerance question is what do you wish that happened to the Jaguar population that lives inside the, your community or inside your area in the next five years? So once again, there were a lot of people in Takana that wanted the species to disappear or at least to decrease more than even to Santa Rosa and Manuripi. Again, with some significance. And we also evaluate if the origin of the, per, the person had some influence on this tolerance. And what we saw is that people from the Amazon had less tolerance to the Jaguar than the people from the Andes, which was some quite, quite considerable different and, and quite interesting and unexpected somehow. We also uh, asked the typical belief or knowledge question, which you send a sentence and see how much they agree or disagree. The sentence was, Jaguars in Bolivia kill more people than dogs. Of course, Jaguars don't kill people in Bolivia, uh, so the correct answer, let's say, it would be disagree. And you, once again, you can see that in Takana, there were more people disagreeing, uh, oh, sorry, agreeing, sorry, missed my mistake, agreeing with the sentence, and that means that they, they, they have more misbeliefs and some mixed misconceptions about the species than in the arid areas, followed by Manuripi and then Santa Rosa. Again, the, the difference was significant. And of course, the, the I think the main main question that we we always want to ask is how many people kill jaguars. Unfortunately, from the people that we asked, the men 43 percent of the men that that we interviewed had already killed jaguars in their lifetimes. So that's a, a considerable uh, large number of jaguar killings, and that's why we try to to work on this to, to, to change the scenario. And the reasoning be, before behind the, the Jaguars killings mainly was security of people. So 60% of the persons that were interviewed said they killed the Jaguar because they were afraid of the Jaguar attacking him or attacking someone of the family. The other main source of, of, um, of justification or cause for Jaguar killing was retaliation to for a jaguar attack to domestic animals or to prevent jaguar attack to domestic uh, animals. So this was the main, and the other ones was mistake or, or because they will sell the parts for to someone, but more in the past than in the present. So we had the diagnosis done and we think we need to do some intervention. So what can we do to change this the current scenario? For funding reasons, we focus only this activity, this intervention on um, the Manuripi Reserve. So we had our, our diagnosis phase, 
with interviews, and then we have an intervention phase with four workshops that I will explain now, and then a re-evaluation uh, to evaluate our impact of our activities to see if they actually change anything uh, with interviews again. So what we did is four activities. And in the first one, we basically is the one we presented the project. We talk about like openly in a, in a forum with different communities so everyone can speak freely to share a little bit about what, what their thoughts are. And to, so we can know a little bit more about what they think and what are the reasons behind the conflict. On the second workshop, we did a, a, a game with, with, with adults where we put we divided the, the the persons in two groups the the snake group and the jaguar group and each one had to come out with a, the the higher number of reasons why each species was the most uh, threatened one the most complicated one most conflict one because as you remember snakes and jaguars were the two main conflict species in this in this area so each each group had to, to come out with a negative uh, reasoning because this each species was was uh, bad let's say and the one who came out with more uh, justifications that were really acceptable it was the one who won then we inverted the game same groups now had to get the more number of justifications why each species is the best or is the goodest so again the one to get more one so we is by this way we make people think of course the negative they already know plenty and also think about the positive and also interact and exchange ideas uh, and then last one uh, in the last workshop on the on the last workshop what we did is we talked to the communities and we tried to figure out what would be the solutions so each person could participate and said identify what will be the solutions to reduce Jaguar conflict in this case, to see to, the, to see what would be the stakeholders that could participate apart from them, that could participate in finding solutions and, um, and, um, and set like an action plan, if you want, that for the community to solve the, the conflicts from, with Jaguar. We also did a, a, a lot of uh, some outreach educational materials, uh, some educational activities. And the main goal of this uh, material and these activities is to change these misbeliefs that we identify on the diagnose, this dangers of a Jaguar and uh, the, the Jaguar is very dangerous and, and can be cause a lot of damage or a lot of human threat to human lives. For instance, we did this poster on, on specifically on Jaguar myths like specifically the one on, on the risk of Jaguar attacks. We went to the local hospital and we asked for data on a number of Jaguar attacks to people, which is zero, of course, number of dog bites, which is 71 in one year, 27 people that were bitten by, by snakes and 276 people that were accidents with uh, motorcycles or cars. So with this information, real information, we want to show, show them the, the, what is the reality that goes beyond their perception in this case. So when we did the work, uh, the action plan, not only the, the community decided what would be the solutions, but we also ask individually each one to share with us what will be their contribution to solve the conflict. And each individual said a pledge what their contribution each one wrote to the pledge and, and took a photograph with the pledge for, for future. So for instance, this guy said, I pledge not to kill Jaguars, just make them go. But some were just as simple as, I will pass the information out to protect the, the Jaguar to other people. So each one decided will be the degree of, 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 of the pledge. And of course, we print a poster, it's in a public space in the in the community, so Everybody knows what every person pledge, and they, they are all pledging to look for solutions to Jaguar conflict. We also work with the kids uh, to try to, to change these misbeliefs and these uh, wrong ideas they have about Jaguar, and we did, in the end, the evaluation. So in terms of emotions, as you can see, when you ask people what you feel about, about the Jaguar, more people say, 
less people said they disliked the Jaguar and more people said after the intervention that they liked the Jaguar. So that's a positive change that we detected. In terms of beliefs, once again, was the, the sentence of uh, the Jaguars kill more people than dogs in Bolivia. We saw that less people agree with this sentence, which is wrong, and more people disagree with the sentence after our intervention. In terms of risk perception, when we ask what's the probability of uh, being attacked by a jaguar, uh, more people say none and less people say high. So there's a, a better perception of reality after our intervention. And in terms of the tolerance, we saw that less people want the jaguar to disappear and to decrease and more people want him to maintain and some more people want to increase after our intervention. So it looks like we got a good, so we did a monitoring of what it did and the results, the indicators show the positive um, change. But unfortunately, sorry, just, uh, okay. Unfortunately, when we ask what we'll do when you meet a Jaguar, still 11% of the people said if they meet a Jaguar face to face, they will kill it. So some work to do there. Our next steps with this will be to reduce the risks of both domestic animals and people by creating livestock pens to reduce the jaguar depredation and some workshops and training how, how to behave when encounter a jaguar. So, and you still continue to the activities and continue to monitoring the results of our activities, both in the actions implemented and the, in, on the changes of, of uh, perceptions of the people. For that, we are working with the San Diego Zoo uh, with support of WASA on educational activities, mainly with kids. And that's it for me. Uh, I would like to thank you again uh, for inviting, inviting me, inviting us to share our, our work. Uh, there's my contacts there if you want to contact me directly. Uh, thank you also all the sponsors of these projects. And once again, thank you, Miguel. Thank you, Not to Serve. Thank you, Joe Bon and Eco, Alliance, Eco Health Alliance. Thank you very much. And thank you. I hope you had an enjoyable uh, presentation. Thank you so much, Nuno, for, for such a wonderful presentation. I'm very enlightened to learn all about the work that Amazon Conservation is doing in the Amazon in Bolivia. Um, I, I will open the floor now for questions. Um, I have a question. What is the largest uh, limitation that, uh, in terms of collaborating with the government that you have encountered? Um, in, in Bolivia, it depends on the level, uh, on the national level. Well, in all the levels, the thing is the politic. The, hmm. There's a lot of, a lot of um, first, there's a lot of changes of personnel. So people change a lot, both in the ministry level and also the technician level. So we have to interact with the uh, different persons uh, throughout the years and have to go back to zero or start working from zero uh, each year almost or each two years, which is very complicated. And uh, and also um, in some cases in the local level, it really depends on the leadership, the interest of the leadership and the politic. If it's more uh, conservation driven or, or sustainability driven than actually just uh, development driven, it makes a difference. Okay, and one one additional question uh, before we go to the uh, public. The, you mentioned that uh, the la castaña uh, has that there has been a decrease in the production of castaña in 2017, I believe. So that 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 actually had had reverberated in the price of the castaña. So I wonder. I was wondering if that had anything to do with climate and if. If um, if that has an effect on future uh, uh, production, so what happens next year uh, on the on the production of castaña? Yeah, that's a very interesting question, very important question. Uh, there is no data that backs the explains fully, but the perception of the researchers who work on Brazil nut and they have been following the the Brazil nut production throughout the years is that it was a climate change event. It was a very dry year with uh, no rain and that they, they think that, that affects directly the, the Brazil nut production 
the that's very very important and now we are working to try to figure out a, a er, early warning system that we can detect how the production is going to be try to have some indicators in terms of climate but also in terms of production of brazil nut in, in with the flowering air season and and with the when they, they the, the plant produces the, the coconut um to try to before have an idea of how, how it's going to be the production and, and try to work with the communities to 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 find the best solution or to 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 deal with that of course one thing that we are working with them is to diversify the, the, their their sources of, of 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 income with other with other natural forests resources like acai or or fishing sustainable fishing but but uh, is a main thing because this is a, a, a crucial activity for the region in bolivia is uh, the main source of money for every community that lives there and not only community even for the region in terms of, of taxes and all that so climate change is a big thing and it's going to be a big thing uh, uh, in the future also to monitor thank you thank you oh. Thank you, Nuno. Um, we have uh, a question of Carlos Zambrana. He has his face, yes. so I'm going to unmute him. Yes. And, and uh, he can talk. Okay. okay, great. Very interesting presentation. I was very, very happy to hear from, from, from Bolivia and the work that you are doing. I'm, I'm, uh, I have a question about the perception, like when you're doing all these surveys, you are relying on that the people are going to tell you the truth. Yes. Right? And it's a big problem because I've, I've done some of this work and you, of course, as a scientist, you you are trusting your your you know, your colleagues, you're trusting the people, you're increasing your sample size, but it's always going to be a degree of uncertainty. And I'm wondering how you are, you know, like handling this problem. Yeah, it's true, it's true. So that's what, this is the, the let's say the base uh, monitoring program, but we do try to time to get other sources of, of information that can uh, use to evaluate our, the efficiency of, of our indicators. It's, it's true that we, we trust a lot with this, uh, what the community says, because uh, basically we work with them more, some of them more than 10 years now. So there's a trusty relationship we expect. Uh, uh, but at the same time, we always look for, for the sources of, of, of information that even from the government, even from local or, or national government uh, and other people that are doing research so we can evaluate. The thing in Bolivia, the problem with Bolivia is that um, there's not very lot of information being collected actually in the field. But it's true, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem that we are always trying to, to look to using other sources of, of that we either we collected also with other institutions or 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 um, or using, even using other methods to, to so we can evaluate each indicator um yeah thank you very much for the question very important yeah thank you so much thank you nuno um we can go to the uh, panel now and there are a couple of questions from what you were presenting so the first question is uh mohammed ismail and his question is during the Brazil nut season, it shows less wildlife habitation in the area. If I am right, what is the alternative seasonal habitats available for wildlife and conflicts during and post season? Yeah, it, it, the animals do, uh, that's a good question. That's something that we want to answer and we want to research uh, deeply in the future because is trying to understand why, where do animals go because it's not that they, they are a lot of space empty. I, I think our perception is that they, they use the space, they use the same space, but they use it differently. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe there's also some time shifting in terms of activity. Maybe some become more nocturnal because people collect Brazil not during the day. They don't enter the, the forest in the night because they cannot see anything and they, it's, it's dangerous for them because it's dangerous because of the snakes and all of that. So maybe there's a, a change of, of activity pattern uh, and also a change in terms of space use. Uh, of course, the smaller species, uh, they, they cannot change a lot. They are less mobility and they're all of them are most usually are territorial. So so it's a very interesting question that we, we, we need to get deeper in. Thank you very much. Nice, thank you. Um, we have uh, two questions by Juan Carlos 
Criales. Um, I'll read one. Um, uh, the first one is how the results could be used for feline monitoring in the Andean zone. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? How the results could be used. Uh, yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, just um, there is a large initiatives that want to monitor wildlife in the in the in, actually in the world scale using like like team now I think it's called Wildlife Insights. And they use, use a standard methodology with camera traps. Uh, so I, we are planning, I think, at least to, to, to follow this, this wave of collaborative and, and uh, so it can help us um, can help us have the, not only the idea of the small scale, of the local scale, but also contribute with information that can understand changes in the, in the larger scale. I think that would be good. And also we do all these camera traps in, the, in, in, in every region that we work. So we have now a baseline information of species occupancy in every area. So now if in the future we do the same uh, methodology, we apply, we can compare and see if there has been some changes or not. Nice. Okay, and uh, Juan Carlos has another question and this is about how your experience in creating cartoons has helped you in your work as a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a very interesting and funny and an important question yeah more than than it may it makes me i'm not a i'm not a drawer i have to say i am the white guy that helps drawing the stories and the concepts behind the stories not the draw i'm not so skilled um unfortunately i tried but it was a disaster um uh, i think it makes me think a little bit more broader when i uh, um, apart from trying to understand the perception of the persons uh, because I have to understand what they think, um, also their knowledge, where their knowledge comes from, uh, and try to work uh, ideas that can explain also how can I pass the information that comes from the science in an easy way and is understandable and not uh, uh, seen as a, um, something that is even aggressive towards what is the local knowledge. Mm, it helped me, I think more or less, it helped me think how to communicate with people and how to uh, understand better the people that we work and uh, and it's fun. <laughs> like I, I usually said, and I said to Miguel a couple of, of well, minutes ago, <laughs> uh, there will be more people reading my our books and our comics than they will be reading our papers for sure. <laughs> Thank you. No. Um, I'm going to read uh, Maria Loza's um, question. She says, thank you for presenting. I enjoyed your presentation. I have two questions. What is the Jaguar's population size in this zone? And is there an increment of Jaguar populations since you started this project? Yeah, we just, this process is from 2017. We don't have enough data to see if there's been changes in Jaguar population. Uh, I don't have a number because what we detected is that there is a different uh, abundance, uh, different densities of jaguars in the areas that we work. There are some, have more jaguars like Tacana, uh, Santa Rosa, for instance, has less jaguars than, than, than and we didn't have a, a good estimate on the, Santa Rosa. We don't have a number. What we do know is that uh, there's a conflict. Jaguars are big kill actually everywhere in Bolivia, unfortunately. Um, and now with the menace uh, that just a couple of years came with the Jaguar trafficking parts that uh, came in, uh, emerged in Bolivia, that can be another incentive incentive to Jaguar killing. So now people are killing because they are afraid of the Jaguars and because Jaguars attack their domestic animals. And as retaliation or preventive measure, they kill Jaguars. Maybe one Jaguars or two Jaguars, I don't know, throughout the year in different areas. But now if there's an incentive to kill Jaguars because there's money there, that can change the scenario. So that's why we think it's important to have this, this, this monitoring also about the, 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 the Jaguar killings and the perceptions and the motives behind it, because uh, things can change quickly if this demand of Jaguar parts in, in, the, in the Orient, it rises uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and can change the scenario totally. In terms of the forestation, which Jaguar is an habitat guy, is a forest guy, forest animal, in terms of forestation, the forestation is still low in, in, in Pando. It's uh, very, very low. So in terms of habitat, there's not been a, a big decrease. There's been a decrease, 
but not as big, not a big threat right now. But things things can change. You can see we see in the, our neighboring Brazil that things can change really fast. All right, great. Um, I am going to read uh, Mohamed Ismail. He asked a question earlier, and so he's saying thanks for the answer. Very my very much happy to see the pre and post results after a workshop. Apart from Jawar, did you do something about snakes since there is since mm. high risk plotted in Takana region? Yeah, that's that's very interesting. Yes, yeah, snakes is is a big thing for them. We didn't work with snakes yet. We thought about it doing a project. We're trying to we're trying to think about trying to get some money to work with snakes. What we did got money. You know, usually charismatic species are more attractive to funding, unfortunately. So we do the work with jaguars, and now we're starting work with giant otters because they are even more endangered than the jaguar, and there are some some data that point that they kill some. So, but snakes is a very important thing, and and uh, and we expect to work in the future. But that's uh, that's something we want to work. All right. Um, now, I uh, Nicole Nuchinkis Nuchinskis. Um, she has a, a long question. I don't know, Nicole, <laughs> are you interested in in speaking? I have unmuted you, and you can talk to Nuno instead. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Hello? I can. We can, can hear you. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah? Am yes. I on? I am. OK. Uh, well, thank you, Nuno, for uh, the whole presentation. I live in Bolivia, and I'm working with uh, animal trafficking, against animal trafficking in Santa Verde down in Yunga, south mm -hmm. of the Amazon region, right? Mm -hmm. And we've been following the whole thing of the killings of the jaguars in Bolivia. And what I thought was um, a bit called my attention in your presentation is that you said that the commercial reason for hunting was less now in the present than in the past. But you just now mm. mentioned, aha, but if there is a now money rising for the Jaguars, for parts of the Jaguar, this may get worse. And actually, this uh, I went to a seminar last year where uh, World Conservation Society, La WSS, presented their data, and they said that the jaguar killings had gone up in very significantly since 2014, when the Chinese enterprises rose significantly in their interventions in Bolivia, in mining and construction. So what do yes. you think about that factor, about the commercial factor? Yeah, the the, the 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 graph was not about comparing past and 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 current killing. It was the reasonings for killing? So some of them said they killed jaguars because, but they killed jaguars in the past, uh, not now. They killed jaguars in the past due to the the selling the skin in the past. You know, before selling sk jaguar skins was something that was legal till 1970 something, uh, and some of them, a low percentage, said they killed jaguars to sell now. That's not no, it's not comparing a past and present. Uh, in sense, the same person killed more in the past or in, or, le or less was more in this actual moment. How, what what are the reasons for people killing? I I think you're right. I think that trafficking is is something that is rising in Bolivia for sure. But in the area that we work, we didn't saw any any evidence that they actually are killing more considerably than they did in the past, in the areas that we work, in these three areas that we work. But we heard a lot about jaguar skins everywhere. Like I said, unfortunately, and I'm sure you know it, everybody, everywhere in Bolivia, jaguars are killed frequently for different reasons. And, uh, and, um, and the trafficking has not been evident in the places that we work, but we know that it's evident and clear and already established in other areas uh, like uh, close to Matidi uh, uh, and, and even in the area of Santa Cruz, if I'm not mistaken. Right, right. May I ask one more question? Of course. <laughs> um, the, the interventions you made, the four workshops, uh, for mm -hmm. right phases or something, is are there plans of maybe sharing this experience and broadening it, in, in, it to other places and, I don't know, having access to that to be able to give it to other people who are working in this? I, I, I'm glad to happily share with what we did. 
you, you can contact me by email. The data we are working to publish, uh, as you know, is a longer process. It's easier to make a, copy, a, a comic than actually make a paper uh, or publish a paper. Uh, but we are published papers about this. Uh, and uh, what we're thinking of actually today we are applying for funding is to continue. So with the communities, we establish an action plan for them in their perspective. And now we're trying to get money to implement this action plan. Uh, and, and to see if you, it works, if you reduce these uh, these issues of conflict, you can actually improve the relationship with Jaguar. But we now have to consider also this trafficking, and and we have to because when we started, uh, like I said, there's nothing there evident, but maybe that can change in the future. So we have to add another 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 variable that they have to look carefully. Right. Thank you, Nuno. Thank you to Thank the whole you. team. Thanks a Thank lot. You. Thank you. Thank you very much for your questions. Thank you so much, Nuno. I think I'm not missing any questions here. I don't know if anybody has uh, another question, if they want to raise their hand. But, yeah, I think you've answered all the questions. It was a great presentation. Thank you so much, Nuno. No, well, thank I, you very much for the invitation. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. The recording of this uh, webinar will be available on the NatureServe, on the Geobong and EcoHealth Alliance website. So please um, uh, stand by for the next uh, series. Thank you so much for your participation. Now I will end this webinar. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Nuno, you again. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you very much.